everybody. Good to see you all once again this Sunday, lovely Sunday morning. Once again, James, if you're listening, these guys miss you terribly, don't they? Are you guys ready? Standing outside the door of love and mercy, you wonder if there's a place there for you. You know there's peace inside, but still you're searching for someone who understands the pain you've been through. While the door's unlocked, the lights are on. What are you waiting for? Come on. Find a place of rest in the arms of spirit. God's waited so long for your homecoming day. God knows the peace you seek and the hurt you're feeling. Spirit wants to hold you and to wipe the tears away. While the Father waits with open arms, God is calling out your name. Come on in, welcome home. You are loved, you belong. of love for someone just like you come on in welcome home you are loved you belong here now no matter where you've been just come on in welcome home you are loved you belong here now no matter where you've been come on in come on Good morning, everybody. If you haven't met me yet, I'm Bev Spivey, co-ministering here with my stage hand, Reverend Lawrence Palmer, who can't stand it if I'm not in the spotlight. <laughs> you can, it's safe. Now, James, when he's back, will declare that this is a season of Virgo because there are several of us with September birthdays. James, me, Harold, where's Steve Roberts, Jim Patilla. Who else is a Virgo? Yes. Well, the joke is it takes us to run the church. So I want you to know that this morning, though, even though he isn't a Virgo, Lawrence noticed we didn't have all the lights on. So. No, Leo doesn't rule. <laughs> anyway, here we go into our wonderful celebration today and a warm greeting to all of you. James finished picking potatoes in Idaho, but I don't know where he is now. North Carolina, I think. He tried to make it back this morning, but it uh, could not do it because of the schedule. He'll be back next week. Meanwhile, we are brilliantly covered by our musicians. We have Orlando on drums. And our versatile Jeff, who is usually the drummer, is filling in on bass. <laughs> John Rose holding down the beat with the keyboard. And of course, our wonderful Samantha Natalie Wallace. Well, as we get started today, we always want to remind everybody of our yearly theme, which is imagination. And it's so very important that we, as adults, and some of us really adults, um, add in that imagination to our everyday life experience, to our thoughts, to take us from expecting the worst or thinking about the worst 
to remember we can always imagine a good outcome, solutions, and more excitement and joy in our everyday life. And the more we focus on that, the more those opportunities will open to us. So this month, our theme is healing, it's health. And so as we have the lessons on that all during September, you'll be thinking about using your imagination to do healthier and healthier things in your life. So let's take this affirmation together. In each moment, miracles are taking place in my body. And indeed they are. We know that our, all our life processes are going on automatically. We're happy to see back several of our members who've been away on medical leave. Anthony, good to see you back. Chuck, of course, and Phil DeRocher, good to see you back. And We've missed you and we're glad you're back. And those of you that we may not have known about, be sure to let us know when you have any kind of challenges, but especially medical challenges. Uh, we have the chaplains and even Lawrence and, and I are happy to uh, support you in all your healing. So let's go forward now with together our vision. Centered in God, we create an ever-expanding spiritual community of one. And we see ourselves with this mission statement. We are a spiritual beacon of inspiration, abundance, and enlightenment. So let's pray as we take those ideas into our heart, refresh our memory that yes, this is our desire to be a beacon of light, to shine forth in our best way, to see our world and its inhabitants in the best way. And so as we breathe together and let go of thoughts of the morning, relax into this day and into this community of acceptance, we are very grateful. We are so very grateful for this spiritual center and these opportunities to understand and to grow. And so it is. Amen. And won't you join me in our prayer today is the prayer for our nation. Together, we have faith in the love and wisdom of God within every person and situation. We affirm that our country's citizens and its leaders are guided to positive, prosperous, harmonious action that manifests the good, highest good for all people. And so it is. Amen. And let us stand now and we're going to sing together a holy, holy way. As James would say, because he's not here, please feel free to sing after me in response. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Let me love, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Let me love, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me know that love is all around.
Well, now's the time in our service where we want to acknowledge anybody who's here for the first time, and we would love to give you our welcome brochure. So if you would raise your hand if you're here for the very first time. I've met some of you, but not all of you. So we want to welcome you. There is information in your chair backs and also in those brochures all about unity. And if you uh, fill out the info card, we will have your contact information to get you on our email list. We're asking these days for people to give their cell phone, too. With our new database system, we will be able to text messages and text back and forth to each other. Uh, that's coming on the horizon. This morning, I want to recognize Reverend Liz Pettiprin. She's here with Reverend Louise. Liz is a dear friend. And... Uh, Liz is a unity minister, nearly retired, <laughs> and she uh, led uh, North of Us, Unity in the Pines, for a lot of years. And uh, in this year, that congregation merged with the Unity Church in Jupiter, Unity in the Gardens. And Liz is enjoying retirement and fill in at times uh, when there are calls for unity ministers. So welcome, Liz. We're really happy to have you here. And everybody is invited to go next door for fellowship time where we can socialize and get to know each other a little better. We also want to let you know how important prayer is to unity. And we have a way here of affirmative prayer, of focusing on that positive possibility. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, we invite you to pray with the chaplains. They are available after every service. They are also available at the half an hour prior to this service, so 10.30. There's a prayer chapel to your right as you go through those breezeway doors. And uh, they will always have a chaplain in there at 10.30 for quiet, private prayer. You may just come in and pray on your own. If you would like the assistance in prayer with a chaplain, all you need to do is ask. There will al always be somebody there holding that prayer space for you. So let's see what we have going on today, shall we? Daily words, there's one left. It's out on the table. Go ahead, fight for it. We're still recruiting for uh, volunteers all month long. The way it works here is we ask for a year commitment. Most people serve one Sunday a month as ushers, as fellowship set up, clean up, as ambassadors. Uh, we also have a uh, building and grounds if you're handy with handy hands. Um, so this information is in Fellowship Hall during our social time, and we ask you to take a look and see where you might be able to help out. We have a huge, huge volunteerism here, upwards of 80%, I think, if we were to count everybody that does everything. <laughs> and yes, it makes our community much more loving and friendly because we all get to know each other that way. And there's that personal reward when you know you are part of your church home, if indeed you have decided it is your home. So take a look at volunteerism, and that will be going on all month. Today we're also going, we have a lot going on today. Grab some snacks. We have a lot of food left today from uh, the wonderful memorial service we had for Rob Mitadiero. And we always have our volunteer food fixers who bring treats for you out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, that's another place you could serve if you like to prepare sandwiches or fruit, fruits and veggies. So um, there's plenty to eat. Go ahead and, and get something to eat. Browse the fellowship tables of the volunteers. And then be ready at 1230. We'll start screaming and whistling and carrying on to get your attention. But the board and Lawrence and I will be having a town hall, entertaining any questions you have. We want to tell you about the bathrooms. We want to share what our finances are looking like midway through the year. We have results of the survey that many of you participated in and probably a couple other things. So stay for town hall. It'll be quick and easy. And then at 1 o'clock right here, Lawrence will start with the usual Sunday sessions from 1 to 2. So hope you can just hang out with us uh, till 2 o'clock today. Sessions, yes. 
Okay, this is now starting prayer week. The activities will be, instead of our, our class, Eye of the Storm has finished, but on Tuesday night we will have a one-night class on how to pray and unity style of prayer, and that's going to be led by Ron Smith over here and Dina Schimmick here and Dee Satterfield there. And they will be sharing, especially, <laughs> thank you, especially for those of you that don't understand unity prayer or may have some questions about it, and those of you who are seasoned in it, please come out and, and be that support. So that is Tuesday night from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Then on Thursday, we, with all of the other unity churches worldwide, will be joining in World Day of Prayer, which means we will have a service here from 7 to 8 on Thursday evening. There will be a special uh, musician guitarist, Cecilia St. King, and again, Ron, Dina, and other chaplains will be involved in this service. It will be a very meaningful, prayerful service. Come prepared with the ideas in your mind of those people that you want to focus your prayer on, and we will have a time during the service for remembering others. So please come out on, on prayer week. Then next Sunday, Lawrence and I will be watching you on live stream as we take a few days, more than a few days, to be over in the Bahamas. So our dear friend, Reverend Darby Line, will be here. She's an interfaith minister. She's wonderful. She will be leading the Sunday service, which will be called Nearer Than the Air. In addition to being a massage therapist, she works with essential oils and aromatherapy in healing modalities. And so after the service, we will have our luncheon in the West Wing. Uh, for those that are wanting to stay, it'll be a $5 lunch. And then uh, her 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock workshop on the energy of essential oils, divine love in a bottle. Now, if you know anyone who's a massage therapist, would you please let them know about this? It's posted on our Facebook page, and you'll be able to also see it on our website, unitypompanobeach.org. The price of the workshop is $20, and any massage therapist that comes should bring his or her license, and they will get two CEUs for the $20, which is unheard of. For those of you who pay for CEUs, you know what a deal that is. So I hope you'll promote this workshop so that we ha can have a good showing uh, and show off our wonderful spiritual center here. And uh, because we all like to eat, on Tuesday night, September 18th, California Pizza Kitchen that's on federal, what, it's between Oakland and Sunrise. Um, it's on that, is it on the west side of federal? Come there any time during the day. If you just say you're, you're eating for Unity Church of Pompano, they are going to be giving back 20%. Uh, so tell your friends the same thing. Eat at California Pizza Kitchen on Tuesday the 18th. For those of you who like to gather, and we do, uh, we're gathering at 7 p.m. for fellowship time with our food at California Pizza Kitchen. They're going to reserve that, that upper loft area for us. If you know or suspect that you may be joining in at that 7 p.m. time, would you please let Dina Schimmick know today um, or next week, too? We just want to let the restaurant know. They, they ask us so they have enough wait staff for us at 7. So lastly is uh, solstice drumming coming up. Oh, it's equinox, isn't it? Wow. Is it equinox or is it solstice? Who keeps up with this? Equinox. It's equinox. What do you know? The slide is correct. <laughs> Autumn equinox. It's a Saturday night, the 22nd, uh, at our usual Pompano Beach uh, beach park area right at the end of it go all the way east on Atlantic and park and go to the grassy space and you'll see us there with drums rattles spoons rocks in bottles anything to make noise for a drumming circle okay that's a lot of announcements but now I'm going to take any middle school kids because I've got Aiden and Catherine and now is a very important time for them and we invite any, any other kids that uh, would sit through a discussion with middle school. And uh, I'm going to be with them. 
uh, while Lawrence and the rest of the service goes on here. Let's stand and greet each other. As James always says, the music stops and we all sit down. Good morning. Sit down. <laughs> I'm Dee Satterfield, and the, the daily word for today is creative process. I am a divine expression of infinite creative energy. Symbolically, the seven days of creation described in the Bible correspond to the seven stages of the creative process. The book of Genesis also shares that humankind was created in the image of God. It stands to reason then that I must be an expression of that same divine energy and an essential part of the creative process. As such, I birth divine ideas into tangible expression in this mortal experience. The creative process is sparked 
by a vague restlessness, a dissatisfaction with what is. Ideas become manifest and clarity begins to take shape when I surrender to the process and affirm, I am divine expression of infinite creative energy. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. I invite you now to settle into that very comfortable and familiar position for your body. And as you do, you can give your body permission to relax, to let go, to let be. And with that loving permission, your body will immediately move its focus from the outer to the inner. You can also give your mind that same loving permission to let go of thinking and processing because this is a time of being. Nothing to do, nothing to think about, but to be immersed in pure being. And with that intention, we are open to the presence of spirit. And with body at ease and mind at ease, we are available then to commune with spirit. The pure heart of our being, connected in oneness. So I invite you to know in that deepest part of yourself, the deepest part of your being, that we are in the presence of pure being. And we are indeed one with that being. So we're able to set everything else aside. We know that it'll be there when we come back. Put all our concerns aside and simply allow ourselves to be immersed in the knowing of the truth of spirit. That truth, that presence, that being does not depend on us. It is there an integral part of who and what we are. So we feel a deep peace in that knowing that there's no struggle, there's no effort, there's no have to, there's no should have. There is pure being. Be open to any image that might come to mind that represents that experience of 
pure being. And for some of you, it may be in a sense of pure, deep, powerful presence and stillness. And for some, it may indeed be images and sounds, feelings. This is your time in communion with the pure presence of being. Allow yourself to enjoy it fully, to be immersed, to be enfolded, to be embraced. And we do so together. Now, as you prepare to return your awareness to this place and this time, you know that even an instant during which your awareness is immersed in that deep of your heart, that healing and transformation take place. And you know that you can bring into your mind, your heart, your body, the essence of this experience in the stillness and take that with you. And as you go into this week that we have begun on this glorious day, Anytime you choose, you can take a deep breath and return once again to the essence and the blessing of this time and experience that joy once again. So now with a deep sense of gratitude for this time of being together, I invite you to take a deep, slow breath in through your nose and hold it for a moment. And then exhale slowly, deliberately through your mouth. And when you're ready, open your eyes and we will sing together, Alleluia.
child of this universe the ocean dances at my feet the wind plays a melody through my hair i am loved at every turn i am kissed by mother earth I am a child of this universe The sun warms me in its embrace The stars have a night for me in the sky I am honored by your life I am held by Father Time Every blade of grass, every shaking leaf on a tree, every mountain top sings of the glory of God moving through. of this universe through my breath all life can breathe i plant the seed in my every dream i can love at every turn give a kiss to mother this universe I greet the God in each face I am the channel for ease to flow I honor all life yes I am one with Father time to every place Every shaking leaf on a tree, every mountain top sings of the glory of God moving through me. As always, thank you, Ben. <laughs> we are thinking together during this month about health and wholeness. And I want to share with you today about spirituality and physical health. And as you saw on the slide next week, Reverend Darby will be here uh, presenting wholeness from her perspective. The following week, I'll be sharing about spirituality and emotional health. And the next week, spirituality and social health. So we're going to cover the gamut all this time. Now, I want to emphasize, as I will over and over again, that we're really talking about wholeness. And underneath all the different ways of looking at things and all the pieces and the parts that we talk about, underneath all of that, we get back to wholeness. Now, wholeness is a principle, and we talked about that uh, two weeks ago, that wholeness does not change. It is something that is, so it doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't become more or less. It is there. So if wholeness is that principle, if wholeness is so huge and wonderful, why is it that we have all this fragmentation? 
If you think about it, when, when we talk about the trinity of humankind, we say spirit, soul, and body in three pieces. Well, that's one division right there. But we take it even further. We're so creative as human beings. Because we take spirit and we say spirit is an uppercase S and spirit is a lowercase S representing the eternal and everything and then our part of that. And then we get to the soul or the mind and we got three phases of mind. And then we have ways of dividing that up as well. So it gets more and more and more divided and then we have the body. So we got all these fragments flying around all over the place. And that's kind of confusing sometimes. So what we're going to do is to recognize that fragmentation. Don't pretend it's not there. But as we know that wholeness is the foundation of everything, we're going to take a look at some of those pieces and parts and understand them a little more so that in the end what we're going to be able to do is put those all back together again in our understanding as wholeness. And we recognize that. And, and there's nothing really wrong with seeing pieces and parts as long as you know you're seeing pieces and parts. And don't get confused about thinking that's reality. Many, many years ago, I, in, when I was a Baptist minister, I was pastoring this little bitty church way out in the middle of nowhere. And all around there were Pentecostal churches. And almost every one of my church members had family who were part of the Pentecostal churches. So very often on Wednesday night when we had our prayer meeting, some of those Pentecostal folks would come and join us in a prayer meeting. And that made it interesting, I'll tell you. If you've never been in a prayer meeting with somebody speaking in tongues, it is quite an experience. And it's a very moving experience when it's very genuine and real. But anyway, there was one old lady who used to come to the prayer meetings. And she would uh, uh, ask us to pray with her for one of the characters on the soap opera because she was being treated so badly by the rest of them. <laughs> There's nothing inherently wrong with soap operas as long as you realize what they are. <laughs> but when they become reality, that's another matter altogether. So all these pieces and parts that we've broken ourselves into is not inherently wrong or bad as long as you realize that this is an artificial thing that we're doing as a something to play with for our human mind to, to enjoy and not reality as such. So I'll continue to remind you of that. Well, there are two things I'd like you to be able to take away from today. One of them is this, that your body is the smallest part of your being. If we're going to talk about pieces and parts, your body is the smallest part of your being. Now, the evidence doesn't really support that because in the United States in 2016, we spent 3.3 trillion dollars on health care. It's projected in 10 years it's going to be double that. And in the United States we spent 8 billion dollars on beauty products <laughs> to keep us lovely, right? Well, we did that on something that is the smallest part of our being. If we take how much time and energy and money we invest in the body and compare that to how much time and energy and money we invest on the rest of us, it gets a little lopsided. I really think that we have begun to believe our delusion. And we've begun to believe this artificial fragmentation of, the human, uh, of ourself because we're acting that way. So in truth, the body is the smallest part of your being. The Gita tells us, no, it's not the Gita, it's uh, Rumi, tells us that that the body, is the, the body is only the instrument of the spirit. A lot of people think that the mind is a product of the brain, but it's exactly the other way around. The brain is a product of the mind. The brain is a tool that the mind uses, and our body is a vehicle in which spirit travels around. So it's important to, to have that very clear in our mind that the body is the smallest part of who and what we are. Now, the body is built in with a default mode. You can be just as ignorant about everything else as you can be, have no clue about spirit whatsoever, and bumble your way through life, and your body has a default mode that's going to get you through. Your body's going to get hungry, you eat, your body's going to digest the food, you're going to drink water, you're going to talk to people, you're going to do things just as default without even thinking about it whatsoever. And it's kind of good that that's true because we'd be popping out of existence all over the place if it didn't operate by itself. Because a lot of people don't have the current consciousness to do that for themselves. And I don't mean that in a critical way, but just factually. So the body operates on its own if that's what it has to do. 
But it's important for us to know, and this is the second thing I'd like for you to take away from today, and that is that we can control our bodies with our minds because the mind, if you will, is a bigger part of us than the body is. If you think about a pyramid or a funnel, that we have spirit and we have soul or mind and then we have body. The body is the outpicturing of the mind. The body is the last representation of our consciousness. So if we start backing up and saying, wait a minute, yes, my body will operate in default mode if it has to, but does it have to? What if I begin to take responsibility for what my body is and what it does? Can I do that? And the answer is, yes, I can. Not only have mystics said that for thousands of years, we have documented stories about mystics doing incredible things with their, their bodies, living off a little parched corn and a little bit of water every once in a while and being perfectly healthy and being able to change the temperature of their body, being able to control everything about their body. It's documented that can happen by mystics, by woo-woo people. All right. Well, science has gotten in on the act now. Because science is proving things that the mystics have been sitting around telling them for thousands of years. We found all kinds of incredible things about the effects of human consciousness. We know it's proven. They've taken pictures of it. They've written mathematical equations about it that you can shoot a photon of light out through there. And when a human is watching it, it acts differently than when a human's not. So we have, through our consciousness, the ability to affect matter. And what is the body made of? It is made of matter. So we can affect the body. They're finding now in studies that we can, through the use of our mind, through deliberate intention, focused consciousness, that we can affect the DNA in our body and change things about our body. Now, the, 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 the possibilities of this are mind-boggling about where this can go. That's a little bit scary, too, when you start thinking about when you project it really far out. So let's not go that far. I don't want to scare you right now. Let's think about what's close by. You hear a lot about prayer and meditation around here, right? Wonder, you ever, ever wonder why? Because it's good for you. We don't have to worry about pleasing God. We don't have to worry about getting brownie points in heaven and all those kind of things, getting another ring on our halo or something or getting a better harp to play or whatever it is that you know, you've been taught about. We don't have to worry about those things. So why is it that we encourage you to pray and, med pray and meditate? Because it's good for you. And again, science has proven now what the mystics have been saying for a long, long time, that meditation, prayer, lowers your blood pressure. It reduces the stress hormones. It slows down aging in your body. And it changes the DNA in your body and makes things happen amazingly. So we can control our bodies. That is the capability we have. Now, I hear it already. I know some of you are thinking it. You're feeling guilty because you're not doing that. I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm saying that you can do this. And it is a function of the level of your consciousness. You don't set a calculus book down in front of a third grader. Or most third graders, anyway. There's some who can do it. Nowadays, that, I can't say that quite as certainly as I used to because the kids are getting smarter all the time. But the being able to do what I'm saying about your body is a function of the level of your consciousness. And we do that very gradually, very deliberately. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore are examples for us of mind controlling the physical body. Myrtle had a terminal illness and she lived way up in old age because she changed her body by her consciousness. Charles had the withered leg and the damaged hearing and the sight and he healed that through his consciousness. We have those examples for us already. And one thing that I've been irritated about with Unity for quite some time is that we tell these stories about Myrtle and Charles and say, ooh, ah, aren't they wonderful? And then we go limping around not doing stuff with our own problems. They did that as an example for us. What they did, we can do. What Jesus did, we can do. We can control our bodies with our minds. Now, the title of this sermon is Spirituality and Physical Health. What I've been saying so far, you could do whether you're spiritual or not. If you really were diligent about meditation and about focused attention, and they're really praying, they just don't know it. <laughs> you can do that whether you're spiritual or not and reap the benefits. When you put your body into a state of conscious relaxation and openness, the universe responds regardless whether you put a spiritual title on it or not. However, when we grasp 
the reality of spirituality, it's like putting that on steroids. It really makes a difference when we're intentional. I'm going to speak more about this this afternoon in the sessions time because I don't have time to do it. Oh my goodness, now. now. There's so much to talk about on this. So, we know that the body is the smallest part of you. And when there are problems in the body, we have the capability, not always the awareness in the moment, we have the capability to affect our body with our mind. And again, this has been documented. So there are two ways that this can be manifested, at least two ways. One is what we call spontaneous remissions or instantaneous healing. You've heard some of those stories. They happen a lot more often than you know because doctors don't talk about it. If somebody goes to the hospital to have surgery and the doctor takes an x-ray and says, hey, you don't need surgery, that's as far as it goes. That usually doesn't get written up in a medical journal. It doesn't make the headlines in the local paper. It's quietly forgotten. But it happens. I saw not long ago a, sonogram, a video of a sonogram of somebody being healed and the tumor doing this on the film, and it's gone. You don't hear about that very much. That happens sometimes. There are people who've been diagnosed with terminal illness with a very short time to live that through the application of human consciousness and spirituality, they are in completely and totally healed in a flash. That happens sometimes. What happens more often, I think because of our consciousness, we've been so steeped in human race consciousness and believing in illness and believing in our limitations, it takes time to wear that down sometimes. So very often the healing that comes, the effect on the human body that comes from our consciousness is incremental. What if you could, and, and you know, we, we try to believe little things first and then grow a little bit. Could you believe that today one cell division in your skin produces a perfect cell? Now, I think it's only a couple of days that the outer level of, of your skin is gone. It's done away with and gets replaced with something else. I've read that it, and this was changed recently, but uh, within seven years, your whole body has been replaced. In seven years from now, you will not have a cell in your body that you have right now. It'll be replaced. Now, what the, bi the body does, and again, it has a default mode to operate. The body says, okay, we're going to make a new cell here. Let's make it just like the old one. And unless somebody says no, that's what happens. And that keeps you here. It keeps perpetuating your body as it is, except it ages. Because the little mechanisms get worn down. What if, through the application of our spiritual awareness, we could say, okay, today all of my skin cells are going to be made brand new. Not like the old one, but brand new. And according to the divine schedule. According to the divine design, according to the divine idea, every skin cell that I make today is going to be according to the divine idea and not the old way. Come here next week and somebody will say, your skin is so radiant. <laughs> now, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but that's the way it happens. You are in control of your body. You have the potential to be in control of your body because that's the way we were made. And in truth, there is no division. There is no body, mind, and spirit. It's one. But we're breaking them apart just to be able to understand it a little better. But your mind can be fully in charge of your body, which means a number of things is that we don't have to go around hurting all the time. Now, I'm not there yet, but I'm sure working on it every day. I'm going to talk more about that in session today too. But every day we work on this a little bit more. Find what you can believe and believe it. Find what you can embrace as true and live it. Find what has power for you and give it a place to manifest in your life. Your body will go right on doing the default mode if you let it. and That's fine. You'll live till you're not living anymore. But through this process of using our spiritual awareness, we can change the way the body is showing up in the world. Where there's illness, we can bring about healing by the use of our mind. Because it is more, it is stronger, it is bigger than the body. So the bigger influences the lesser. 
we can find ourselves not aging as much. I was telling somebody about this yesterday. I, a long time ago, before I really understood things as I do now metaphysically, I, I told my family that I was withdrawing my conscious participation in the aging process. <laughs> I refused to consciously participate. Evidently, the body's going on with me, without me. Um, my son pointed out one day when my beard first started turning gray that, you know, how's that aging thing going for you? And I said, this... <laughs> This gray is your fault. <laughs> you did this. <laughs> but aging is one of those things that we have more control over than we've ever known. The potential is there to say to the body, what if every cell in your body, every cell, when it started to divide, that cell said, hey, let's make a brand new one. Let's make one that's just like the divine idea. Let's make one that is perfect in form and perfect in function like never before. If every cell did that, what would happen? You would, as the Bible says, be made new. You would be transformed. And that is the potential. That is the possibility. Start one cell at a time. I remember the first time I went to Washington, D.C., walking around with my mouth hanging open. These humongous buildings, these single buildings that are a block in, in size, and I walked up to one of them and looked, and it's far up that way, and it's far that way, and far that way. It was made out of brick. Bricks. Now, how did that humongous building get built? One brick at a time. And before you know it, there was this humongous building there. If we start this process one cell at a time, what's going to happen? We're going to, as Mr. Fillmore talked about, regenerate our whole body one cell at a time. Surely, Jesus said faith is a mustard seed. You can move a mountain. Surely, we together can believe that one cell in this day can be made new instead of being made old. When we do that, at some point, the aging process is going to be changed. It's going to be different because our body is not aging anymore. And even the possibility of reversing the aging now, I heard someone say the other day, oh, I'd love to be 18 again. I said, oh, God, no. <laughs> Please, I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> but you have a choice. You know, I, I think that gray looks fairly distinguished, so I don't really want to, I don't want to do away with all of this, but uh, I don't want to ache and creak like I am beginning to. So aging is different. That's something that's big for us. We're concerned about it. Any of you, no, don't raise any hands. How many of you have some anti-aging serum in your bathroom? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, that's on our mind. Another big thing in this same direction is that of dying. Now, I've said for years that my intention is to live fully in health, every day checking off my list of things that are mine to do, and one day I'm going to get up and there's no more items on my list. And at that moment, I'm going to go and hug and kiss everybody and go, and I'm gone. Perfect health. We don't have to be in horrible physical condition to die. We don't have to die as we usually think about it. Now again, this is graduate school stuff. So we don't have to worry about jumping up and doing it tomorrow, but let's do it one cell at a time. What if we had that intention, that clear intention that I'm going to live here fully functional, full in health, doing exactly what is mine to do and nothing else until I don't have anything else that's mine to do. And then I'm going to find out what's on the other side. And I'm going to do it consciously, joyfully. It's been done. There are some examples in the Bible and the other we'll talk about later. So, one thing, your body is the smallest part of you the second thing is that we have the potential to completely control our body with our mind. And when we understand this to be our spiritual heritage, it makes it even more powerful. Now, the important thing to do is to begin. So I challenge you, this day, tell your body and you're in charge. Remember what Myrtle did when Myrtle was healing? I won't read the, the long quote, but Myrtle said she talked to her body. She talked to all of her organs and apologized to them for so meanly using them. 
And she said, my eyes are beautiful, bright eyes. And she complimented her body. She talked to her body and she healed herself. She wasn't some loony that didn't know what was going on. She knew exactly what she was doing and it worked. A terminal illness was done away with. And she talked to her body. So I invite you to talk to your body. Talk to your skin and just say one cell. Or if you're really gung-ho, do two. <laughs> or a dozen. But call for your skin to produce a perfect skin cell. Perfect in form, perfect in function, perfect in divine idea. And then call for another, and then another, and another. And brick by brick, we're going to build this humongous building. Cell by cell, we're going to change our life. It'll make a difference in the world. Now, one other thing. i got two minutes. I'll take two minutes. I don't see Bev looking in the window yet. <laughs> and I'll be talking more about this in sessions this afternoon. It's also important that we have a sense of purpose. If you just want to live because you're afraid to die, you're going to live in fear and die in fear. If you just want to be healthy because you're afraid of not being healthy, you might be healthy, but you're going to live in fear of not being healthy. So a sense of purpose is important. Jesus said, I have come that you may have miserable life. <laughs> Jesus said, I have come that you might have, come on, somebody's read it, <laughs> abundant life. Abundant life. If we have a purpose, I don't want to die because I want to live the abundant life. I'm not afraid of dying anymore. You know, how many of you like roller coasters? Not too many. How? Oh. Let's go to Disney sometime. You get on the roller coaster and you go right up there. I love to sit right in the front. And you get up here and you're like this and there's that moment before it drops. Sheer terror and delight. That's the way I feel about dying. I don't know what in the world is going to be over there and I, I'm a little bit like this over it, but I'm not scared of it. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it. And it'll be at the right time. So... If we live, if we try to live, we strive to live, we try to paste ourselves back together enough not to die because we're afraid of dying, you're going to constantly live in fear, and that's not the way we're supposed to be. So look within your heart, look within that spiritual truth that is yours, and find that purpose of living the abundant life, living the powerful life, living the joyful life, living the pleasurable life, you know, that, that, that's another whole sermon, though, of looking at be the beauty in the world. What's wrong with spending a day doing nothing but looking at the beauty in the world? I think God does a lot of those. You think about one more thing. You think about the, you've seen the pictures of all the, the galaxies and everything that the Hubble telescope is picking up and all the amazing colors. And you think, it's just sitting out there all by itself doing nothing. That seems kind of useless, doesn't it? Well, I get the idea of God being able to look down and see all of those things at one time. It's like our looking at a rose or our looking at a sunset or a sunrise. And God looks at all of those galaxies that are without end out there and goes, very good, very good. So what's wrong with us every once in a while finding a deep purpose and looking around at our world, looking into the eyes of the people that you love and say, this is very good, this is very good is very good. This is very good. God bless you. Our lesson today that we just talked about was, in addition to the power of order, was who I am makes a difference. That's worth each of you thinking about. Who you are makes a difference. And your giving makes a difference here. This is a time when we collect what we have to give. Now, those of you who are members, if I did it right and you check your email, you will have an email from me 
but it's from our Breeze database inviting you to go on and make a member profile. This is the start of what will be our whole system that there's also going to be a, a directory that you can opt in for. This is certainly a way for you to follow your giving, your attendance. It's going to be a way for us to communicate with our volunteers and team members by text. We will also have the ability to text offerings. Uh, your giving can be done by text in the future. Uh, you can set up your own account. I know some of you had asked me, you don't want to go through PayPal, but you want to give a recurring gift. Setting up this member profile, you'll see on that you're able to do it. So check your email. Let us know through emailing the office what might not have worked right. I'm learning this system too, but very excited about it. So thank you for all that you give here. It enables us to do everything that we do with love and joy. So let us bless our offerings together. With a grateful heart, I acknowledge God as source of all that is. Today I declare good for myself and all others. Good is mine. Good and more good is mine. And ever increasing good is mine. Everywhere I go, I see this good. I feel it, I experience it, I freely give it, and it multiplies itself around me, and so it is. Told me I'm essential. How are my fears so limiting my potential? Said it's time to step into the light and use every bit of power I have inside it. So, what you waiting on? Who you waiting for? If you don't take a chance, you'll never know what's in store. Just do you. Somebody's gotta be a star. Just do you. Somebody's gotta raise the bar. Just do you. So what you waiting on, who you waiting for? If you don't take a chance, you'll never know what's in store. Just do you, somebody's got to be a star. Just do you, somebody's got to raise the bar. Just do you, somebody's got to change the game. Just do you today. If you create the game, then you create the rules. And if you just be you, there's no way you can lose it. There's a story waiting for you to write it. There's a treasure waiting for you to find it. There's a picture waiting for you to paint it. And there's a dollar waiting for you to make it. So what you waiting for Samantha, please. <laughs> the
There were a lot of words in that song. You did great. Thank you so much, musicians. Well, as our chaplains are getting in position to pray with you, some of our team leaders are heading out the door to man the fellowship tables so you can browse what our volunteer opportunities are. Of course, we're going to have a town hall meeting and then Sunday session, so there's more to come. But for now, I invite you to pray with our chaplains, and let's all stand and close with our prayer for protection. Together, the light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God wherever we go. God is, and all is well. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that Wonderful weekend. Thank you.